This is the Married to Doctors podcast, episode number 48. I believe that our job as parents is to equip our children to meet the challenges and opportunities of the real world. Because when they leave our home, whether it's at 18 or 25 or God help us 30 years old, they're going to meet the real world. And the real world is very different than what they're going to be, you know, seeing at home with mom and dad. Welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. Because we know that being married to a doctor isn't always as glamorous as it sounds. Our podcast helps successful homes be happier. We're here to build community, hear your stories, and explore solutions with the experts. Here's your host, Laura McKeldry. Hello, everyone. So excited to be back with you again for episode 48. I'm excited about this episode. We talk about how to raise a kid when you have money but not turn the kid into a spoiled brat. Is it wrong to meet their needs? Obviously, it's not wrong to meet a child's needs. That's our responsibility. But what about their wants? Where do we draw the line? What's correct? Are we creating little monsters? Or are we creating kids that can, you know, survive and thrive in the world? So we talk about these things today. Ben has a lot of experience working with physician families, and he was excited to record this episode. I think you're going to really enjoy it. I want to thank all of you so much for leaving me reviews, for sharing the show. I have the best listeners ever. So huge shout out to each and every one of you that helps this to be a success. We will jump into this great episode after a word from our sponsor. Today's sponsored minute is with Lawrence Keller of Physician Financial Services. Lawrence, what are the biggest misconceptions that you think physicians have when it comes to disability insurance? Number one is first and foremost, since the industry is heavily regulated, you will not be paying anything more by purchasing your disability insurance from a, you know, quote unquote, experienced agent than you would by purchasing your policy from a newly licensed or inexperienced insurance agent or broker. In fact, if the policies are structured the same way and all agents are showing policies with the same discounts, the premium rate will be the same. And the only way that one agent can provide a lower price to the consumer is by having access to or knowing of a discount plan that another agent simply does not. Another big misconception when it comes to group long-term disability plans and individual policies and how they work together. So unlike medical insurance, there's no such thing as a primary or secondary company. And if you meet the definition of total disability under both policies, you can potentially collect full benefits under both policies. Additionally, with the exception of those eligible to purchase coverage under the new in-practice limits, Generally, those are available if you're in the last six months of training or the first year or two of practicing, and you're going to be eligible for group long-term disability coverage with a future employer, it must be taken into consideration when determining the amount of individual coverage available. And deferring the enrollment into a mandatory group LTD plan to potentially allow you to purchase a larger amount of individual coverage simply does not work as that eligibility must be disclosed on your application for coverage. All right. Excellent advice. There's a lot to learn. And if you guys need to learn more, you can find more from Lawrence at physicianfinancialservices.com. I am so excited to have Ben Utley here today. He is very passionate about helping families and children, especially. He is a certified financial planner. He's also been married for 24 years. He has two teenage girls. His practice as a financial planner is really just with physician families. And so he's been featured in places like Physicians Practice and the White Coat Investor, the New York Times. He has been in practice for 20 years and serves more than 70 clients that are physicians or married to physicians. And we're just so glad to have him here on the show to talk about children and money. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thanks, Laura. It's happy to be here. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. I have a list of questions here. The first one might almost even sound rude, and it's certainly not a blanket statement because we know that some physicians are excellent with money. But in general, why do you think that doctors aren't maybe as good with money as one might expect? Um, I think you could probably flip the question and, and ask, like, why aren't patients better with their health than everybody expects? 
right? I mean, how, how much training do, do I have in, in medicine as a guy who's just a financial advisor? And I, I think the amount of medical training that I have is probably comparable to the amount of financial training that the average doctor has. So, you know, if you, if you don't have that kind of training and it, it is not somewhere in your background, of course, you're not going to be good with money. And I, I think people in general are not good with money. But uh, when, you, when you take the amount of money that a physician sees over the course of their career, then you just kind of magnify a small problem with a larger amount of money. So it looks like they're bad with money, but really they're just kind of as good or as bad as the rest of us are because physicians are people too. And, you know, really, I think you have to step back and, and ask the question. So, you know, if we collectively, if all of us are kind of bad with money, how would we get good with money? Like, where did we miss out along the way? And when you look at the school systems, you know, they don't typically teach about money in school. They teach you to count it, what it looks like, but they don't teach you to handle it or manage it or, or make it do what you want it to do. So uh, if they're not teaching it in schools and, you know, clearly physicians aren't getting it in their training programs, then we have to ask the question, how do we get it? And, uh, you know, if you're like me, you grew up in a household where uh, they, there was some financial skills. And I learned some of the things that I, I know from my parents and a lot of it I learned from reading and my training. But when you look at where most people would get it, it would be in the household. And so if you grew up in a household where either there wasn't money or perhaps your parents weren't comfortable talking about money with you or they just never bothered to teach you about money, then there'd be no way you could be good with money. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And my listeners that have listened to me for a while have heard me share bits and pieces of my childhood and you know, my parents got a lot of things right, but one thing we didn't necessarily do well was talk about money. So mm -hmm. if you're not used to talking about money with your kiddos, how would you suggest someone could maybe get comfortable with that? Well, you know, we, we live in the, the greatest capitalist nation that's, that's ever existed. So at some point in your interaction with your kiddos, you're going to bump into some kind of money question. And I think that we bump into that pretty often, but if we're not prepared for it, it's, it's really easy to kind of deflect the question or you know, dance around the question or, or worse, just to give them an answer that is kind of like the first thing that pops into our head maybe. I think it's kind of like the first time your kids ask about drugs or the first time they ask about sex or the first time they ask about any of these things that are kind of in the world that we live in and that they may encounter in their world, uh, you know, you don't jump right in there with a four-year-old and, and give them all the, the gory details. You ask them, like, well, what do you mean by that? You know, tell me, tell me more about your question or how did you, how did you hear about that? You want to find out where that child's coming from, try to get in their space, and then answer appropriately at that level. And I, I think the thing that can be really challenging is, first, you kind of need to know where, you're, where you come from on the topic, kind of how you feel about it and what your values are and then be able to kind of construct messages and, and uh, teachable moments so that it is relatable to that child. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And it's interesting because this is probably, you know, when, you, when it comes to parenting, there's a hundred ways to do it, right? And probably no one right way. And so what's comfortable for one parent may not be comfortable for the next parent. And exactly. I'm sure that every parent will have reasons why they don't share the details of the checkbook. And another family may have, you know, a list of 10 reasons why their child is the one that's balancing the checkbook, you know? Right, right. But you can talk about, you know, what a checkbook is and what it looks like and what is a check and what is a bank. And I mean, you'd be surprised the number of people who really don't understand, like, how does a bank work? I put my money in there and I get some money back or I borrow money from them and I, I give them money. But it's like, how does a bank really work? You know, right. and it's, it's actually pretty simple if you drill down and you do some learning about that. And so uh, maybe it's an opportunity to, to learn yourself as you teach your children, you know, kind of stay a chapter ahead of them and have conversations around those. So, you know, they don't have to know how much money you have in order to be able to know how to handle the money that they may have in their lives. Yeah, that's good. And let's be honest, like, who knows how to use a check? I mean... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, mean, like, I, I write right? like two a year now. It seems like you know we do everything electronically, so it's, yeah. it's getting even more and more abstract. The idea it, of money, I think. Yeah, when I, when I started in an industry twenty years ago, people would ask. They'd ask me like, "How do? What's my routing number?" And I'd say, "It's that number between the smiley faces on your check, the sideways smiley faces, because that's the little symbols for, for the routing number." But I can't even say that anymore because there's so many people who just don't deal with checks and kids have, have never seen a check. Right, <laughs> right. It's totally different. So, yeah. But um, 
you know, as physician families, a lot of us are fortunate enough now, not us listeners, we're still waiting on those glory <laughs> days, but a lot of people do make money, which I think is excellent. I like to have a feeling that there is plenty to go around. But in this world that we live in, if we are so fortunate to have money, how do we raise our children to not become entitled? I don't want to use the word spoiled, but maybe I should. But like, how do we keep our kids from that sense of entitlement? Well, so let's go back to this for, for a second, okay? So let's imagine the opposite of an entitled child, right? So an entitled child kind of takes everything for granted. Uh, you know, it's kind of gimme, gimme, it's me, me. There's no please, there's no thank you. There's no sense of gratitude, right? That's what we think of as like this, this bull rotten brat. We don't want that. So the opposite of that is perhaps a child who is thankful for everything they get. Uh, it's always please and thank you. And I mean, the, the deepest sense of this is, wow, uh, thanks for this apple. And by that, I don't mean computer. I mean like food. This apple is just so great. And, and when you find somebody who's like, ultra thankful for an apple, either it's the first time they've had one or they don't get apples very often. So I, you kind of look at this and you think, well, if my child is super, super grateful for everything that we give them, then maybe they don't have enough. And I don't expect to see that in a physician household, but uh, you could imagine a child who is very grateful for just the very basic needs in life or for occasionally getting a want, uh, want met. And that might be a child who's, who's going without. So the way I kind of think of this, and, and I'm a father of two teenage daughters, so I go through it myself. When my kids are taking me for granted, that is a sign that I'm getting an A plus in doing my job because I'm providing everything that that child needs and perhaps some of the things that they want. So uh, you have to be careful about what you wish for and you have to be careful about the, uh, the, the thought of, of an entitled spoiled child. Yeah, I really like the positive spin you put on that because it's just a neat way of looking at it as, you know, my child is provided for. And exactly the, the, the idea that they can take these things for granted is actually, you know, a blessing. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing that they can take the fact that there's food in the home all the time for granted. I was exposed to this for the first time. There's a, a couple I serve there. Um, one's a radiation oncologist and the other one is a surgeon. And uh, she was complaining to me one time that this couple had spent the better part of the entire weekend. And we know how precious it is for a couple like that to even get time in the same room, spent the better part of the weekend repainting this child's room. And she came home and she just kind of threw her books down. It's like, oh, blah, blah. Yeah, my room's painted. And the parents were just stunned. Like they felt totally taken for granted. This is the first time I was ever exposed to this thought. And I was like, how is it that that child can take this for granted? Like what has to happen for that to be the case? that this kid could take it for granted. And that's where I kind of came up with that aha moment about, about this. It was in you know, working with that couple. Yeah, I think that's, that's a nice way of looking at it. It's definitely a kinder way of looking at it, you know, that we're good providers versus we're spoiling our kids. And then hopefully in the future, you know, we're still teaching them values. It's not like we're not teaching them values just because we're providing for them. Yeah, exactly. Another important question that comes up a lot in family circles and raising kids is the allowance question. So here it is, dun, 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 dun. Should or should we not <laughs> give our kids an allowance? Well, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride the fence here a little bit and say that this is a personal decision and it's going to be different for everyone and yada, yada, all that stuff. And I, I do believe it's personal, but I do have a really strongly held belief uh, around allowance. And, and it comes from this. I believe that our, our job as parents is to equip our, our children to meet the challenges and the opportunities of the real world. Because when they, when they leave our home, whether it's at 18 or 25 or God help us 30 years old, they're going to meet the real world. And the real world is very different than what they're going to be you know, seeing at home with mom and dad. So um, the question I have is where in the real world do people give you money without the expectation of performance? And where in the real world do people give you money in, ex in exchange for the expectation of you performing something that you don't want to do? I mean, you can quit a job, right? Uh, but you can't quit being someone's child. So I look at that and I think, does giving a child an allowance, for me, does that prepare them to meet the real world? 
And my, my answer to that is a resounding no. So there, the arguments for allowance that I've heard say, well, kids have got to have some money in order to be able to get some experience handling money. And I kind of think, well, kids need some experience in getting money. And there are basically three ways that you can get that money. You can get a job, you can start a business, or you can get a return on an investment. And that's what I teach my kids. So I've taught them all three different ways to get money so that they're prepared to get money in the real world. Um, I, I personally was raised with a small allowance. One day I, I lost that allowance and I never got it back. And that taught me a huge life lesson uh, about the, the getting of money. And that was where I started thinking like, okay, well, how can I get money for the stuff that I want? Yeah, like I've heard the question asked before, would you rather earn a million dollars or have someone give you a million dollars? And I think the better answer is earn a million because then you could earn a second million, right? Like you would know how to earn more money if something went down. Yeah, and um, personally, I, I would like to have a little bit of both because when you get that million dollars in your hands, it's not the getting of it, it's the keeping of it that makes a difference. And in both of those scenarios, you're going to get the million dollars, but when you earn it, first you have the confidence of the ability to go back and earn it again in case you lose it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second is you, you're more likely to be careful with that money such that you don't lose it. It, it. it basically, you know, the farmers say it's not what goes through your hands. It's what sticks to your fingers that counts. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So in your household, then your girls earn money, but they have to earn it, right? It's not just, Hey, here's an allowance because you're my child, but it's, you know, like a chore chart type of situation. Yeah. And, and actually they, they don't even have to earn it. I mean, they can, they can do without money in my household. So the way I kind of think of it is uh, there's, a, there's a book by, originally by Peter Dominguez called Your Money or Your Life. And I may be messing up the, the author, but it's called Your Money or Your Life. I read it a couple of years after it was released. In that book, he talks about needs, wants, and wishes. Okay, so I believe that as a parent, it is, it is my job to provide everything that my children need as I see needs. And the needs in my household may be different than in Laura's household, and that might be different in somebody else's household, but my definition of needs is what I intend to provide for my children. I think that that's what I signed up for when I made the decision to become a parent, okay? Wants are the things that a child clearly wants but doesn't necessarily need, and I'll give you an example. Uh, for example, if your kid likes labels, if they like brand names, or maybe if they want a, a toy that somebody else has, a toy is not a need, it's a want, okay? Uh, designer fashion is not a need, it's a want. To me, a need is what you could buy at Target, or a need is school supplies. So the difference between the cost of the need and cost of the want is what I would expect my kid to come up with, because they can do without wants and they can't do without needs. And so I think that teaching a kid to get what they want is, is pretty cool because in the beginning it might be a toy or uh, something that they want to buy, but in the end it might be a job, it might be a spouse, it might be a home, you know, it might be uh, an experience of a lifetime. And if they learn to get what they want on their own, then they're going to be more equipped for the real world. And, and as a side note to this, when your kids realize that you're going to provide for all their needs and maybe some of their wants, they will stop asking you for money. Oh, okay. So that's really interesting because I was just getting ready to ask you, you know, if they feel so well taken care of, like they always have their school clothes, their school supplies, all their needs are being met. You know, if they do come to you and ask for extra money for things, is it okay to just give your kids extra money because they want the extra money for something? Well, to be clear, a, a child should feel very well taken care of. They should feel special. They should not feel uh, a sense of, of deprivation. You know, it's, it's our job to provide for them because a child can't develop adequately if they're not in a safe environment. And part of feeling safe is having the things that you need, okay? Uh, if they come to you for more money than they have, then you can always say, hey, what are you planning on buying? First off, you want to know what it is so it's safe for them. You want to make sure it's consistent with your values. So you figure out what it is that they are asking you for money for. And then, you know, if you're not sure whether or not you should give it to them, just look at them and say, I don't know. Is that a want or a need? Tell me about that. And if they're like, well, you know, uh, I've been wanting this for a long time because so-and-so has it. Well, you know, maybe that's a want and maybe just deny the request. But if they say, well, I need this money because, uh, you know, I'm going to go on a band trip and uh, we're going to stop and buy food. Clearly, that's a need. You want to feed your kid. So I think it really is reflecting back. And you can use the child uh, as an ally in, in answering that question 
and, and having them kind of think through it as, as needs versus wants. And like I say, sooner or later, they will continue to ask for what they need and they'll ask for money for the things that they need, but uh, they will be very careful to, about when it comes to asking for things that they want. Yeah, and I love this because it's really what it's doing is it's teaching our children about decision making. Absolutely. Can we talk about that? I want to talk about decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. So this, this thing about managing money and kids handling money, it's really not any different than anything else. Uh, I don't know why money is so taboo. It is very taboo, but we teach kids to uh, handle all kinds of things, their time, friendships, all kinds of responsibilities. And ultimately, when you look at how someone handles something, it comes down to what they decide to do about it or with it. Okay. So it comes down to decision making. What you want to do is you want to start as early as you can in educating your child and training your child to be an excellent decision maker. And the way you do that, well, the way that, the way that I did it and the way that I saw it done by some parents that we modeled was by using what they found in a book called Love and Logic. Love and Logic basically says that we're all capable of making good decisions if we live with our own consequences from making those decisions and we have the freedom to make those decisions. So for example, um, as adults, we're like, should I buy the expensive house or should I buy the cheap house? As kids, it's like, should I buy the, the brand name or should I buy uh, the cheap stuff? With kids, younger kids, it's like, well, you know, do you want to put on your pants or do you want mommy to put your pants on for you? And even younger kids that are pre-verbal, you know, you can hold a, a red toy in one hand, a blue toy in the other hand, hold your hands out in, in a giving gesture to that child and have them point to the object that they want because they know whether they want red or blue in most cases. And there, you know, if, if your child is old enough to point to something and see something, you can begin to train them to make decisions. And that is where the, the management of money begins is in, in the making of good decisions. Yeah. And children that have made decisions with money, I think on a continuous basis as they've grown, they've got such an advantage when they get out there in the big world. You know, you hear these horror stories of kids going off to college and they're just not prepared for it. You yeah, know? exactly. Exactly. If you make all their decisions for them, then when they get out there and they have to make a decision, they're going to be a, a rank novice. You want your child to be an expert decision maker when it comes down to, uh, gosh, you know, should I get in the car with the, with the kids that are drinking or should I call mom and, or walk home? You know, that's mm -hmm. a tough decision. And it's, it's, a, it's a big person decision. But if that's the first decision that they've made, the chance of our peer pressure is going to come in and they, they won't have it. So to me, decision making is like the ultimate survival skill. And it just so happens to be the root of handling money well. So if you're teaching your kids to handle money, you're teaching them other life skills that go just a long way. Yeah. And I, I love the idea of like, kind of putting your kids on a budget to some extent, you know, you have X number of spending dollars. Think about what you have going on this week or this month, you know, yeah, <laughs> and exactly. use it wisely, you know, yeah. like all these things are optional. If you get, you know, a drink at the Friday night football game or not will depend on whether or not you maybe bought the extra candy bar at lunchtime or whatever. That's right. And you can teach them about budgeting really early on. You know, um, when you go to the grocery store, you say, hey, you know, we have $50 for this run or $200 for this run or God help you, you're going to Costco. You got $500 for the run, you know, <laughs> but you can uh, let kids shop and comparison shop and you can, you can say, hey, here's the money that I have. Get it out in cash. Get it out in ones and say this costs this many because money is this really abstract concept but kids below a certain age are they're concrete thinkers they need to hold stuff and touch stuff so you know if you're paying them pay them in dimes and nickels or if you're paying an older child pay them in dollars because they can hold these things and uh if you're if you're fortunate enough to pay your kids for household chores and you can pay them in something that's evenly divisible by tens then you can teach them spend share save which is like We've talked about the three ways to get money, and now I'm talking about the three things that you can do with money. You can spend it, you can share it, which is giving it away, donating it, tithing it to give it to charity, or you can save it to spend in the future. And so I, I want to digress for a second and talk about saving. The only way that your child is going to learn to save, as best I know, this has been my personal experience, is by forcing them to save in the beginning. So when they get money, uh, forcing them to save some of it, teaching them the habit of it, because saving is, um, it's, a, it's a deferred gratification thing, and this is not something that younger children are going to get, and it's something that some of your older children won't get either. So it just has to become a habit. 
it's Let's like be like, honest. Most adults don't get this. <laughs> no, absolutely. And most and most most adults, you know, they don't floss. But uh, right. flossing is one of those things you do now because uh, it keeps your dental bill down in the long run. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's not not super fun idea, but it's so worth it. You know, it it's it's payoff in the long run. It's yeah, very important. Another thing, speaking of the long run, is college, right? So, oh yeah, the big C. Yeah, and this is something else that's debated among parents. You know, should we pay for it? Should we pay for all of it? Part of it? Should we pay uh, state school prices, private school prices? What are your thoughts on paying for college and saving for it? Well, it goes back to preparation for the real world and uh, meeting a child's needs. Okay, so if you believe that uh, the high school education that your kid gets is going to be enough to prepare them for the real world, then you don't need to pay for college, right? But I mean, how many people listening to this podcast believe that? You're all married to doctors. You know that, that education is a path to higher earnings. So we know that a, a, a basic education of some sort you know, even a, even a four-year degree is a need. It's something that you need to make in this world. And the economic research shows that folks who have degrees earn a multiple of those who don't have degrees. So, you know, giving your, your child a leg up, education is a great way to go. I, I love to spend on education as a parent because it's, it's the only thing that I can buy for my kids that they can't take back and that they'll have for the rest of their lives. So I, I personally believe in education and I believe in paying for education. So really the question becomes like, how do you afford this thing and, uh, and how do you start saving for it? What are your thoughts on that? What do you think is the best way to save for college? Uh, early and often and, and all the time. Yeah. So um, when my daughter, my first daughter was born, I began saving uh, on, on that day and uh, she's about ready to go off to college and we have everything saved that she's going to need for school. It's just one of those things that's, that's hard because when your kids are that young, you know, you probably need to be saving about $500 a month if you're planning to send your kid to an in-state school. Double that, if not a little bit more than that, if you're planning to send your kid to a private college. This may be news to a lot of people, but the cost of college has been doubling uh, about every 10 years. So it's been growing at about a 7% rate, which outstrips inflation by a good three or four percentage points. So I'm not sure why that's the case. I don't know if it will persist. Uh, everybody has to kind of answer that for themselves, but it doubles about every 10 years. So by the time that you're, you know, right now college is about oh, $25,000, $26,000 for an in-state, uh, a year at an in-state, and that's tuition, room, books, and food. Okay. By the time that, that kid is ready to go off to, to college uh, in dollars, it's going to be $100,000 a year. And I'm not talking about for Harvard or Stanford. I'm talking about for the school down the street. Because if we double 25,000 twice, is, once is 50,000, twice is 100,000. Okay, if you're shooting for private, the sticker price on private is 50 or $60,000. So now we're talking about 200, well, let's see, 60, 120, $240,000 for that one year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it's unbelievable what college will cost if things don't change. Uh, and so it's important to invest for college because that 7% rate that co college grows at, it, it's going to take a somewhat aggressive investment to be able to match that. And so that's kind of like the, the mathematics behind it. Probably the best way to save for college for practically anybody who's listening is to use a 529 college savings plan. They're, uh, almost every state has one. Uh, they're, they're pretty easy to figure out. And that's, uh, that's typically where we start. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. And I agree. Like the cost of college is crazy and it just, it does, it keeps going up. And then on the flip side of that, we keep seeing in the news, these stories that like, I think it was NYU just a couple weeks ago announced like medical school is paid for, for all of these, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh my goodness, like that's completely the opposite. And so I don't know yeah. what higher ed is going to do in the future. I'm like, this is going to like grow and grow and then burst and then be free or be triple what it is today. We don't know. Yeah. Well, if you're listening to this podcast, you're a little late for that party, right? <laughs> I know. It's so depressing. It's like daily it's and dollar short. Oh yeah. I mean, we typically see people come in with three or $400,000 in student loans. I mean, you, you hear that the average is like 180 to $190,000 in student loans for docs. Right. And, and I think that's true, but what they're not telling you is that 
many of the people who graduate in the medical school programs here come from another country and their parents have paid for it. So they're getting out with a zero. But if you're one of those folks who sent yourself to a public school and uh, now you're in medical school, you're coming out with a 400,000 and the average of zero and 400,000 is really close to 180 to $190,000. So, um, you know, we, we thought this is such a problem that I actually hired a guy who specializes in student loan repayment. That's, that's a big chunk of his job. We have direct contacts with some of the, with the some of the folks who refinance these things. We have a deep knowledge of PSLF. It is it is just um, twenty years ago. I I didn't know anything about student loans. Ten years ago, it was vaguely on my radar. But right now, it's front and center, and practically every client that we see coming through the door, it's it's one of their, their primary issues. Yeah, and it's interesting that we would spend that much money on education, but I think that really shows the value that physicians and their families put on education and put on, you know, the knowledge. And I think it's respectable that one would go into such debt to gain, gain the knowledge and gain the training to be good physicians and spending and how we spend our money. I think it is often a reflection of what we value. Absolutely. Yeah. And every time you make a decision, you know, in, in your household or with your children, you are, you're navigating a, a, a maze of, of invisible barriers. And those invisible barriers are your values. They're the, this, the, the set of hidden rules that guide the decision-making process that you have. When you buy a big house or a small house or a, a nice car or a used car, or when you eat out or you stay in, or you, know, you say, we can't afford that, or we don't have the money for it, or we choose not to spend on that, you're exerting your values. And every time you make a decision, every time you make a choice with money, you are demonstrating that value. You're showing the result of that hidden rule to a child. It's almost like uh, it's like being on the office or something. There's a documentary. The camera is always rolling, except that camera's in your child's eye. And they're watching everything that you do. It's all getting recorded. They're not necessarily making you know notes on a notepad, but it's all going in there. I mean, if you've ever sworn out loud and heard your child repeat it, you know they're recording this, right? Right. So uh, <laughs> it's not exactly proud moments. But uh, as we deal with money, the kids are watching. They're always watching. Yeah, that, that's interesting to consider that that's a reflection of our values. I don't necessarily equate, equate it that quickly in my mind. But now that we talk about it, it makes perfect sense. You know, you what are you spending your money on? And you know, do you give to a charity? Do you pay a tithing to a church? Yeah, how you spend your time, how you spend your money, it's definitely going to teach do, your kids what you prioritize. Do you tithe on the gross or the net? I mean, there's, there's a value decision. You know, it's like mm -hmm. every little decision has something to do with it. So um, I think that kind of discovering some of your own values around money, are, that's helpful if you intend to kind of to parent your children in this direction. There is a really great book by a woman, I believe her name is Eileen Gallo, uh, the, the title of the book is Silver Spoon Kids, like children that are raised with a silver spoon. <laughs> I know that if, if you're still in training, you're not eating off silver spoons and, and lucky if you have time to eat off uh, plastic spoons, but you probably have time to buy her book. It's a, a great read. It will expose you to some concepts that you may not have seen before. Uh, and I, I really recommend that you, you get that. She, I, I recall, I believe she's a PhD in uh, has a masterful presentation of this and even a list of values that you can kind of uh, start as a, as an inventory to discover some of your own values. It's a great read. Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to check it out. And I'll put links in the show notes to these books that, that we've mentioned on this interview. You bet. I kind of wanted to wrap up. We've been talking a lot about kids, which is great. That's what I wanted this to be about. But because you do have this experience working with couples and physician couples, I wanted to kind of end with this question, and that is, you know, what's the source of contention that comes into your office um, when people come in to talk about money? What it, what is the? I mean, I would like to think there's never any contention, right? And we're all on the same page when it comes to money, but I'm certain that isn't true. So, what what's some of the contention points you see among medical couples when they're making money decisions? Oh, wow, Laura, you you have just like. I mean, is this going to be like the six hour podcast? Because you have just opened up the, a huge can of worms here. Uh, big, big topic. I mean, it's like you're wrapping in all of the, of the goodness and learning. And I'm, I'm being facetious. It goes into marriage with all, the, uh, with all the taboos of money and all the family history that he's got, that she's got. And just bringing it all down and uh, ask me to, to give you that in a, in a five second soundbite. 
I guess if I was going to kind of search through my experience, and this is something that, that it's like people think that we talk about stocks and bonds. I assure you that I talk about this way, way more than we ever talk about investments. The, the his and hers money thing. <laughs> it's one of the very first things that we tackle when we start working with folks. But it all comes down to this. He's a spender. She's a saver. Or she's a spender. He's a saver. If you're both spenders, no problem. If you're, if you're both savers, no problem. In your marriage, anyway, okay? But if you differ on the spending and saving, then uh, one of you wants to move forward and build financial security, while the other one wants to enjoy the moment. And you can't have your cake and eat it, too. The thing I like to tell, parent, uh, tell clients is, you know, if you're saving, then you're, you're going to get to spend all the money that you make, right? You're going to get to spend some of it now and some of it later, but you will get to spend all of it. Okay, but that's sometimes that's hard to hear, and it's it's that balance of consumption between uh, you know what you're going to spend now, what you're going to spend later. That balance, getting that balance right, is really the root of planning. Because look, let's face it, if you if you had ten or twenty million dollars, you wouldn't need to worry about what you're going to spend now, what you're going to spend later, because you'd have plenty. But if you're you know if you're working off a budget that starts at you know one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year, then you kind of have to think about like what am I spending now versus what am I going to spend later. Or if you're in a, on a, a training budget, maybe your household income is $50,000, you have to be very careful. I would just say it really comes down to that. And like I said previously, all of these spending decisions are really come down to values. So uh, count yourself really lucky if you've married someone and you see eye to eye and you share common values and goals, because it is just a blessing to have that in your marriage. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And when you don't see eye to eye, any advice? <laughs> Just work, um, talk through it, <laughs> work through it. Come you think it's see me. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you got to get on the same page somehow. And that might be, uh, that might be marriage counseling. Uh, there's also, oh, there's a fantastic book on this topic. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just lay this out there. I love the title. It's called How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It. How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It. Um, it's actually required reading for people who come on my staff uh, because we do dwell in this. And everyone on my staff who's read that book has gone home and used what they've learned, and it's immediately improved their marriages. It improved my marriage, and particularly how we uh, how we handle money. It's just it's a great book, and that's a place that I would start. Okay, awesome. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. I think it's interesting that even though you deal in the finance world, like you said, it's kind of the marriage world too, because <laughs> and the family world, because our money is our values. Our values reflect our money, and it's just it's fascinating to me. Well, I, I appreciate that. This is, this is just a topic that I'm passionate about, that I'm, I'm kind of a, it's just something I've read about and studied for years and years, and I see it in my practice, and I, I just, I love it. So I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to chat about it. Absolutely. And if someone wants to find you, what's the best way to find you? Um, where our best way to find us is on the web. It's physicianfamily.com, P-H-Y-S-I-C-I-A-N, then the word family.com. All right. Excellent. Thanks again for being on the show. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Married to Doctors podcast. Our mission is to make successful homes happier. To learn more or to share your story, visit our website at marriedtodoctors.com.